Good morning. Good morning. Are you awake yet? Did it get loud this morning? Get a little loud in this church, right? And uh, do y'all like to get loud? Do y'all know that heaven is uh, going to be loud, right? There's going to be all different types of instruments. We're going to be shouting holy, holy to the Lord. And uh, it's going to get a little loud in heaven. So we were just kind of preparing you for heaven today in the worship experience. Let's give God some praise one more time for what he's doing here. And so today, um, it's, it's an honor. It's, it's a special day. This is the first major offering uh, that we'll be taking up in our church, uh, that a yearly offering uh, called the Expansion Offering. And for the last two weeks, we've been praying over what God would call us to give uh, to this offering. And really, we've been talking about it for the last four weeks, but we've been in this series for two weeks called Together. And what has to do with that and this offering is that we've also been praying uh, that God would give us a word as a church to connect to this offering that we would be believing him for and declaring over the life of our church in 2022. And God gave us the word together. And so we are praying, we're believing that City Light Church would experience a unity and a togetherness uh, that is just far beyond what we ever thought was possible in this up and coming year of 2022. Because if a church can get together, amen, if we can come together and rally around a common mission and a common vision, and if we can come together and rally around the mission of Jesus Christ, we can change the world. Somebody say amen. And uh, I really can't wait to see all that God is going to do uh, through this incredible day as we unleash a wave of generosity. Amen. And also, you've been praying for your word uh, that God has given you for this up and coming year of 2022. And we've got these together cards on all of the seats. And if you'll flip that over on the back of it, you can actually write the word that you are believing God for. Maybe it's breakthrough, maybe it's healing, uh, maybe it's uh, uh, um, healing or salvation or something else that you're believing God for. Maybe it's something you want to give to God. Maybe it's insecurity. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's doubt. Maybe it's depression or anxiety. And, and, and just take that card, write that word on it, and take that with you throughout this new year. You know, put it in your Bible, put it somewhere where you're not going to lose it, where you can just see it everywhere you go. And then also, on your way out today, um, we've got a together poster board where you can write that word on that board, myself and our staff, will be praying for that word for you uh, every single time we meet, every single week as a staff and as a lead team, praying that God uh, would give you the harvest of your word. And so, and so today, if we would come together, amen, and give sacrificially, we'll be able to expand the kingdom further than we ever thought was possible. So I want us to know today that, that it is a giving sermon today. I want to go ahead and prepare you up front. Everybody gets a little tense when, when you start talking about giving. We, we, we talk about giving often. Maybe we're not always going to have a whole sermon committed to it. Uh, but every time we get to this time of the year and we get ready for this offering, we will be talking more about the power of giving. So I want to tell you up front, I want you to know the ushers already locked the doors. You can't leave now. So don't even attempt to. No, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, you, you can leave for sure. But, uh, but it, it may be best for you to stay. Because although it may be a challenging message, it may push us a little bit, may push some of us a lot. I want you to know something. It could be the very message that changes your life. It could be the very day that you finally surrender something over to God that you have been holding on to your whole life. It might be the day where you finally put God at the center of your life and take your finances out of the center of your life. It could be the best thing that could ever happen uh, in your life. So I want us to know today as we dive into this, it's, it's not about us giving an equal amount today. It's about us giving sacrificially equally. It's about equal sacrifice today. I, I want you to know that as you sacrifice today and you give as God leads and God guides and, and God's directs you, I want you to know that you're sowing into good soil. I want you to know that we are a, a church. We are one church in two locations. We have a campus in Monteagle, Tennessee, and and we launched a City Light Church Mont Eagle in Chattanooga just, just nine weeks ago. And the first nine weeks, we have baptized 22 people. And we have seen over 50 decisions for people to follow Jesus. Isn't that awesome? God's moving here. God 
is doing something special. We're seeing marriages restored. Uh, we're seeing the unchangeable change. Uh, we're seeing the homeless minister to. Uh, we're seeing uh, men get set free from the power of addiction at a ministry that we support called Mosaic Recovery Center. Where are some of the Mosaic guys that we got right here? And back here, y'all give it up for our Mosaic guys that come here and serve every single week. And we've got 20 other men in our program that are serving at our Mont Eagle campus this morning. It's a ministry that we support. Uh, we're also going to be writing a check, another check, immediately out of this offering to the Choices Crisis Pregnancy Center. And I want you to know uh, that our financial support is helping them give free ultrasounds to women that are considering abortion. And statistics say once they see that baby on that screen and they see that heartbeat and they see that life, they go ahead and choose life. And so just know uh, this offering is going to change lives physically, spiritually, in so many different ways. We'll be making campus upgrades here as well. Uh, this offering is going to be a game changer. But without us coming together, without us sowing obediently, none of this will be possible. So what I want to do is I want to... I want to take a few minutes, and I want to preach on this subject, and then we'll break it down. And I'm not starting out with a big chunk of Scripture today. We're going to be in a topical message, and we're going to be flipping throughout the New Testament, Old Testament. Uh, so get your Bibles ready, get your pens ready, get ready to burn that city light pen up, because we're going to be jumping all throughout Scripture talking about the topic of giving. But what I want to do, I want to talk about this subject. I want to talk about together giving. Somebody shout together. Together giving. Today we're giving to an offering. We're giving above and beyond our tithes. So I'm gonna I'm gonna preach on giving today. And it's like I said, it's gonna push us, it's gonna challenge us, but it's gonna be a good challenge. And I want us to know this: giving uh, is different than tithing. You may say, I thought they were the same. Giving is much different uh, than tithing. Uh, the Bible says that the tithe is the 10% that we give to God in return to what he has given us, and we give it to the local church, we give it to the expansion of his kingdom, and we do that every time we receive income. Uh, the Bible, in fact, says if you do not do this in Malachi 3, that you are actually robbing God. So tithing in Scripture isn't even considered as giving, it's considered as not stealing. Oh, that's crazy, isn't it? We thought... Thought we were being so generous, you know, but really that's like the bottom rung standard. And so in the New Testament, we see uh, people giving far beyond uh, the 10%, far beyond the bottom rung standard, because they realized that God had given them far more than 10%. How many of you know that when God sent his son, he just didn't give us 10% of his son, but he gave all of his son? How many of you know that when he went to the cross, he didn't just shed 10% of his blood, but he shed 100% of his blood? That's why no matter what we give today, we could never outgive God. God, because he gave us his only begotten son, the son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, to die in our place. And so we could never outgive him, but because he paid this price for us, and because he gave himself above and beyond, we return it back to him through our giving. Out of gratitude, we just want to be so generous to the Lord that's been so generous to us. So we're going to talk about being true together givers today. And what I want to do is I want to give us three main application points and really three ways that we can give above and beyond the tithe. And so if, if you're taking notes, you can write this first point down. Give together and spontaneously. Give together and spontaneously. There will be a time in your life as you follow Jesus where God is going to lead you to give spontaneously. And it's going to happen outside the four walls of a church. Maybe you see it happen all the time. Maybe you run into somebody in your office and, and maybe it's a single mother and they can't pay their rent and God just leads you to help meet a need because you've got more than what you need and God leads you and you obey because you're available. It, it might be that you run into a homeless person and God just pierces your heart and you just hear the Holy Spirit say, hey, you need to meet a need. So you go get that homeless person some food and you meet a need because you can do it because you've got extra in your life. Honestly, this is the way most people give. This is where a lot of people start. Many of you have given this way many times, maybe 
uh, when a natural disaster happens on the other side of the country or maybe on the other side of the world and there's a flood or there's an earthquake or there's a hurricane and, and, and you didn't wake up expecting to give to that, but you see it on the news and you're like, hey, God pierces your heart and you give to that and you meet a need in somebody's life. You weren't thinking of doing it. You just do it spontaneously, right? And so this, this is the way a man, known, a man in Scripture known as the Good Samaritan gives. And it's a really powerful example of somebody giving uh, spontaneously. And so Jesus tells this story and he tells this parable. And if you don't know this story, it's, it's a Jewish man that was beaten up by robbers and thieves and he was left on the side of the road basically to die. And as the story unfolds, several people pass by and and Jewish people pass by, and religious people pass by, and none of them really cared at all. They just let their fellow Jew on the side of the road, let him struggle. He's hurting, he's broken, he's, he's in pain, and they just pass on by, and they don't even bat an eye at him. Then there is a Samaritan that comes by, and a Samaritan and a Jew didn't really talk to each other at all. They hated each other, actually. And the Samaritan walks by, and he sees this Jewish man, and he just has a heart for God, and he goes and he meets the need. He gives him some bandages. He puts some oil on his wounds. And so he didn't expect to do that that day. He didn't plan on running into that person that day. But what he did is he woke up that morning and said, hey, I'm a servant of the Most High God. I am available, and if God tells me to do something, I'm going to do it. My yes is on the altar. And so he has this opportunity, he meets this need, and this is what the Bible says in Luke chapter 10, verse 35. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. You know what he does? He goes above and beyond for this guy. He bandages his wounds, puts some oil on him, and then he picks him up and he carries him to an inn. And he pays for his stay, and he's willing to pay for any extra expenses. I want to encourage you to give like that as Jesus followers. If you're able to, to give spontaneously. You want to know why this is important? Because it builds your faith in a major way, doesn't it? Those of you that have met a need, those of you that that followed God in this, and those of you uh, that saw a need in somebody's life, and you blessed them, and and they are so encouraged by it, and they tell you, man, we're so blessed by it. But how many of you know that you leave more blessed than they did? Amen? Because the Bible's true, right? It's, It's more blessed to give than it is to receive, and it blesses you so much more. And I've just got countless stories that come to my mind of times where God has pierced my heart to give like a big gift to somebody, or maybe it was a cheeseburger. And I want you to know this, every single time God blows my mind. The what God does, the way God moves, and how he always brings it back into my life, and how God will use it sometimes to even lead somebody to faith in Christ because they feel and experience the love of Christ. I want to encourage you to give spontaneously, but I don't want you to stop there, amen? Don't just give spontaneously, but also number two, we should give together and strategically, strategically. We got to be strategic in our giving because I promise you it's going to happen today. You're going to say, man, I wish I could give more to this offering today, but I can't. What I want you to know is that if you plan, you can. Did y'all hear what I said? If you will plan to give, you will be positioned to give more. Because here's the thing. If you're just now praying this morning about what to give, maybe you haven't had a plan, you know. It's been hard to maybe say, I don't know about y'all, when I give to an offer like this, i got to save up a little bit. You know what I'm talking about? And I've got to be strategic, and I've got to have a plan, and it takes some time to get this stuff together. What I want us to know is, is if you will plan to give, it's quiet in this church, by the way, on this giving sermon. But if you will plan, you can Here's what I want us to know. If it will become a part of your heart, that it's not just something we do for an hour and a half on a Sunday morning, but if this will become a part of your heart and your values and your strategy and your budget and your finances, you can if you plan. We are strategic givers as followers of Christ. So the first 10% that comes in strategically and prayerfully Out of a heart of worship and return to God for what he's given us, we give it through the local church. We don't give last, we give first. Somebody say amen. He is not a God that we give our leftovers to, amen. 
He is a God that said, hey, come to me. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. I want to give him what's first. Money hits my account. I want to give it to God before I give it to my house note. I want to give it to God before I give it to the insurance company. I want to give it to God before I give it to my cable company. I want to make sure that he is first in every aspect of my life because if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. I want him to be at the center of everything. This is one of the many areas where we say, God, we worship you first. It's not a give when we want to. It's not a give when it's convenient. No, I'm not just doing it when I'm prompted. I'm strategic. I'm prayerfully going through this, and I want to be generous to God. I love what Isaiah says in 32.8. Listen to what he says about generous people. He says, but a generous man devices generous things. He plans it out, and by generosity, he shall stand. A generous man plans, devices, generous things. They plan to do what is generous, and the Bible says that they will be able to continue to be generous. Most of us, how do we plan when it comes to our money? If we're honest, we typically plan so that we can consume it later on. Come on, somebody. We very rarely will change our financial plans to give more to the kingdom of God. Typically, most people will make plans financially so that they can consume more of it later on. We plan to consume. We want something, we see it, we want it, we claim it, we grab it, and we put it on layaway if we've got to. Come on, somebody. Ladies, come on, let me get to preaching to ladies. You see that purse. Oh, everybody's got Louis Vuitton now. Used to be coach, but now it's Louis Vuitton. You know, I gotta have a Louis Vuitton. Because when I walk up into church, I want my Louis Vuitton when I'm praising Jesus. I'm gonna look so awesome. Guys, come on, you gotta get them new shoes. You know, you gotta, hey, I'm gonna look so cool. Worship. These are these are the feet that are sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Gotta have good shoes on. There's nothing wrong with having a nice purse. I want you to know there's nothing wrong with having nice things. But we gotta be careful to make sure that we don't just plan to consume, but we also plan to contribute. That we include God in our plans. That, that, that he would be at the center of our finances. We plan to consume. But as Jesus followers, we are not called to be spiritual consumers. We, we are not these people that say the church exists for us. No, we say we are the church and we exist for the world. And God has called us to be spiritual contributors. Thank you. That one clap today. So instead of just planning to make the purchase, what if Jesus' followers plan to give to something that would go beyond our lives? Where we make changes in our lives and get strategic in our spending so we can give a higher percentage to the glory of God. People all the time say, ah, Pastor, I wish I could give more. And my response is, you can if you plan. Because here's what I know. If it's important to you, you'll do it. If it's important to you, you will do it. If he is everything to you and he is hot on your heart, you will make changes in your calendar to be in church on Sunday morning. If he is everything to you, you will shift things around. You will make it happen because you are so consumed with who he is. And as we get closer to a new year, I don't know about y'all, but I'm already praying over the New Year resolutions. I'm already praying about how I'm going to go on a diet. Amen. Anybody like like me, I got. I need like a good month to prepare for a diet. I just got to get myself ready and just you know boost myself up. Watch some watch some videos. You know, listen to what's that big linebacker from the Ravens? What was his name? Uh, what was his name? Big guy. Mert killed somebody. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Ray Lewis. Got to listen to some Ray Lewis to get pumped up to go on a diet. I just I just have to prepare for it, right? And many times we are making preparations for New Year resolution. Oftentimes it it surrounds our health and we want to lose weight and we want to get in shape and we get gym memberships. But here's what I want to ask us today. Do you have any spiritual goals for 2022? Do you have any financial goals that, that, hey, we want to give a bigger percentage to the kingdom of God in 2022 than we did in 2021? And so I just, I just want to be honest with you. I want to just lead the way today as, as your pastor. 
Every year, Kayla and I, we want to increase the percentage of our income, even if it's just a little bit, that we give to the church. Every year, we have a bigger percentage. And, and we're praying, and we're believing, and we're planning that we'll be able to give a bigger percentage next year than we did this year. We want to give spontaneously and strategically. Listen, I want you to know this, you know, I just tell people all the time, you know, kind of the story and my testimony of coming to faith to the Lord and the brokenness of a jail cell and God saving me from all different types of things and struggles and addictions and, and all different types of sinfulness. I was a wretched man for sure and how he just called me to preach in a jail cell and I went to Bible college and I started, started preaching God's word and started pastoring in church about 10 years ago, which is now our Mont Eagle campus. I remember when my wife Kayla and I first started pastoring that church of 30 people, y'all, 30 people that actually started with seven people and I think I started out making $100 a week at the church. And I was working at Cracker Barrel on the side right over here on East Ridge. Y'all don't tip too good at Cracker Barrel on East Ridge. Just got to tell y'all, you get pennies over there, y'all. It was rough. And I, and I remember whenever I got my first full-time salary as, as a pastor, my wife and I were living in a little income-based apartment in Mont Eagle, Tennessee. And I remember there were times we were laughing about it last night where we wanted like to go to Wendy's and we would scrap up some change. To go to Wendy's. Y'all remember them days? Come on. And But I want you to know something. Although we had little, I want you to know something. We were faithful. We were faithful with the little. And God says if you'll be faithful with the little, he will give you more because he knows he can trust you with it. And so the more we are, if we would be faithful with what we have, God will increase us with more. And here it is for 10 years of our, we've almost been married 10 years now, and we've been faithful. I can say that today, God is my witness, Holy Spirit testify, testifying within me that we've been faithful in our giving. And I believe every good thing that we have in our life is because we've been faithful. And I just want you to know, you know, we, just this last year, we, we were able to build a home in Mont Eagle, Tennessee for just really, really, it was really cost efficient. It was in a time where we got materials really cheap. And we were able to, and then whenever we go to plant this church here in Chattanooga, the market erupted. And we were able to almost make double what our house was worth. And we were able to write the biggest check we've ever been able to write to the launch of this church. But I want you to know, there was a time where we were scrounging up change to go to Wendy's. I share that not to brag. I share that to say, be faithful with where you are right now. I was able to write something I never thought I would ever be able to write to a church. But God has been faithful. Be strategic. And you're giving. And I love hearing the stories. That's my story about, I, I love hearing the stories of how people have experienced just that in their life through their giving when we give strategically. Number three is our wrap up, because I can tell y'all are ready for me to wrap this up. We want to give together and we want to give sacrificially. Give together and sacrificially. There are so many powerful examples of sacrificial giving in scripture. And to me, one of the ones that really stands out is really an interesting passage. It's in Mark chapter 12. And it's, it's in the 12th chapter of Mark's gospel. And as you see this unfold, Jesus, they're taking up an offering in the temple. And what's interesting about this is, is that Jesus watches what they give to the offering. <laughs> Can you all imagine Y'all think we nervous now. Could you imagine I'm just like looking at everybody we get, we take today. Mm -hmm. I see what you give, and I'm looking at your name. Then I get online, I look, uh, okay, okay. Could you imagine how awkward and weird that would be? I'm like, man, I'd be, I would just be cringing, right? Jesus sat there, and he watched what everybody put in the offering plate. And he's watching. And, and, and Mark said this. He said, listen, a lot of rich people threw in large amounts that day. And he saw them putting in large amounts. But then there was a poor widow who came, and she put in two small copper coins, only worth a few cents. And, and watch what it says in verse 43. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all these who have given to the treasure. For they all put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. Now, two things that really stand out to me about this. 
is number one, Jesus watched, right? Come on, that just stands out. The second thing that stands out to me is that Jesus didn't stop her from giving. That's probably the biggest thing that jumps out of the pages to me. Because as pastors, as leaders, we somebody's struggling and it's a widow, we're called to take care of the widow, right? And so if we saw a widow putting in the little bit that she had left, a lot of us would be like, no, 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 sweetheart, you, you keep that. Not only do you need to keep that, but we're going to help you and we're going to come alongside you. We're gonna... But Jesus, I want you to know something. He did not rob her of the blessing of putting seed into the ground. He did not rob her of her blessing of giving sacrificially. And here it is 2,000 years later, and we are still talking about this. And Jesus didn't celebrate the ones based on what they gave. He celebrated the one based on what she had left. She gave it all. All that she had out of her poverty, she gave sacrificially. And Jesus commended her and celebrated her for her sacrificial gift. So I just want to ask the question, when was the last time you gave to God sacrificially? Where it was a sacrifice, where you felt it, where you had to change some things in your life for it to really be a sacrifice. God's not asking equal giving today. He's asking for equal sacrifice today. A sacrifice for someone, it might be a dollar a day, it might be ten dollars, it might be a thousand, it might be thirty thousand today. Just ask God, God, I want to give you a sacrifice today. And then let him celebrate it in your life. I want you to know this as I get ready to close and Pastor Daniel can help me wrap wrap up. I'm going to ask you to be generous today. I'm going to challenge you to be generous. Not just today, but I'm going to challenge you to live generously in your life. And I want you to find a church where you can practice generosity. I want you to know, you may never hear a preacher say this. I didn't say my church. I said a church. If you hang around here at City Light Church for a while, and by the way, it's your first time here today, like just, it's okay, you don't got to give today. Hang around a little bit, and if you hang around for a little bit and you say, if you don't like this, if you don't like us and what we do here and what God's called us to do, and you're like, man, I just don't know if I can give here, I don't know if I can be all in here, I want you to know something right now. You come to me, you tell me that, I'm not going to be mad at you, I'm not going to bash you, I'm not going to talk bad, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tell you about five or six wonderful churches in the city that you can go and possibly get plugged into. Because I love you more than I love our attendance. I would rather see you grow in your relationship with Christ than to see this room get full. If you can't do it here, if you can't give here, if you can't serve here, if you can't get all in here, I want you so badly to find a place where you can get all in and be fully surrendered because I know it will absolutely change your life. If you can get to that place. But if this is your church, this is the place that God has called you to be at be all in Jesus said I wish you were hot or cold not lukewarm how can we say we're hot for God if we're still holding on to our checkbook how can we say he's at the center of our lives when we've yet to surrender our finances You know, as we study scripture, we realize that Jesus talked more about money than he did heaven and hell combined. That just blows my mind. And the reason why is because he knew the most likely idol to be formed in your life is your finances. I want to teach you something real quick. and I'm going to try to do it in five minutes. Actually, i got more time than five minutes, don't I? I'm going to try to do it in 10 minutes. Can I, do, can I have 10 more minutes? Just shout amen if I can have 10 more minutes. Can I teach you something in Scripture maybe you've never seen before? Can I do that? Yeah. That, like, scares people. They're like, what are you, making up something? You ever hear a preacher say that? You're like, what, is he just going to, like, twist it or something? No. 
It's, it's, it's in the text. So I want to I share something with you. As we think about our finances becoming an idol in our life, Jesus uh, has this moment with some of the religious elite, and they try to trip him up. And, and watch what happens here in Mark chapter 12, verse 14. When they had come, and I want you to know, to give you the context, it was just shortly before this, Jesus went in and flipped the tables in the temple. I remember that. You know, Jesus didn't have like sheep on his shoulders and he just floated where he walked and he was, he come up in there mad, y'all. And he flipped the tables and, and he drove people out with whips. Would y'all imagine? And it was because they had turned the house of the Lord into a den of thieves. It had become a place of profit. Not a place where God was at the center, but a place where money was at the center. And Jesus got more mad about that than anything else in his earthly ministry. So it says, when they had come, they had said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one. Like, you're just a savage. We've learned that about you. For you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, don't miss this, why do you test me? Bring me a denarii that I may see it. So they brought it. And he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus had answered and said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And the Bible says they marveled at him. Now, obviously, they're trying to trip Jesus up, and, and this is the priesthood trying to do this. And I just want to give you a little backdrop to where the priesthood is at at this moment. The, heat, the, the, heat, the high priest, the priesthood, started with a person named Aaron thousands of years prior to this moment in Scripture. And from Aaron all the way to a priest named Jason, throughout those hundreds and hundreds and even thousands of years, it was passed down through birth. And the high priest was the one that was representative of God to the people and the people to God. He's the one that could go in one time a year and make a sacrifice to the Lord on behalf of the people, and he could go into the presence of God. And for all those years, the priesthood was passed down through birth. So Aaron's sons became the next high priest, and, and then the next one, the next one, all the way down to Jason. It came through genealogy, and it came through their heritage. But when you get to about 170 years before Christ was born, you no longer received the priesthood through birth, but the one that could bring the most money would become the high priest. And so instead of receiving the priesthood like God intended, it went to the highest bidder. And so if you were really wealthy, really rich, you could actually buy the priesthood. And that's when Herod the Great steps in and he starts corrupting the priesthood. The man, I want you to know this, the man occupying the office that condemned Jesus to the cross doesn't even have the right to be in the position. He bought it. So people in the first century hated the religious leaders because their hearts were consumed with greed. We got a lot of that happening today, don't we? In churches today. Same thing they're struggling with 2,000 years ago. We're, we're struggling with today. They turned the marketplace, they turned the house of God into a marketplace. Greed had consumed their hearts. They're not givers, they're takers. And so they want to trip Jesus up. So they ask him an impossible question. If he answers it one or the other way, it's going to be bad for Jesus. But you have to understand, to pay your taxes as a Jew, Pontius Pilate required they pay taxes with a denarii that has a coin with the image of Caesar on it, okay? And so on that coin, it had an image of Caesar, and under it, it had an inscription that said, Caesar was God. So you could imagine how huge of a disrespect this was to a Jew that is possessing this coin that's basically idolatry. So if Jesus says, yes, you should pay your taxes, he's a coward and he's bended to the hand of Rome and he is a traitor to his Jewish heritage. 
If he says no, we shouldn't pay the tax, he would be tried for treason by Rome and he would be arrested and imprisoned. And so they're asking him this because they finally feel like, man, we can corner him and we can arrest him today. We can crucify him today. But they don't understand that this is the Messiah. This is the Son of God. And he responds so brilliantly. And here's the way he responded. This is what he was wanting us to know. This is what he wanted them to know. And here's what he wanted us to know. That God trumps everything. And allegiance to him is priority in our lives. Jesus shows us that he expects undivided allegiance. Because I want you to know, the denarii wasn't even supposed to be possessed by a Jew. The fact that a Jew possessed this coin they would be guilty of idolatry. Why is that? There's a graven image on it. And Jesus is making a connection with the Ten Commandment in Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, that says, you shall not make for yourself what? A carved image or any likeness. Same two words, image and likeness, are the same two words he used, image and inscription in the Greek New Testament. And here's where this will just blow your mind. The same two words are used in Genesis 126. Then God said, let us make man in our own image, according to our likeness. So here's what Jesus is saying. Give me the coin. And the moment they pulled the coin out of their pocket, they immediately condemned themselves. And he said, whose image is on the coin? Whose inscription? Whose likeness? And they said, Caesar is stamped on the coin. But what Jesus is saying without even saying is saying, whose image is stamped on you? You have given yourself to an image that is stamped on a coin and you are consumed with greed when you should be giving all of your life, all of your soul, all of your heart to the only one that has stamped his image on you. You are created in the image of God, so worship God, sacrifice to God. You are the apex of his creation. You are the only one that God created and he stamped you with his image. So who do we worship today? We worship the one that stamped us. We worship him alone. We don't worship money. We don't worship things. We don't worship any of that stuff where we're in bondage to it. Our allegiance cannot be divided. Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. I want you to know something today. Benjamin Franklin didn't stamp his image on you. Benjamin Franklin didn't die for you. Benjamin Franklin can't save you. Your money can't get you into heaven. Your money can't bring you peace and joy and fulfillment. Some of the most miserable people are the most rich people I've ever met in my life. Your money cannot be a God that delivers. Jesus knows that. And he loves you enough to tell you by talking more about it than heaven and hell. So today, we get to give to an offering to show God we're not consumed with an image stamped on a green piece of paper. We want to give. We want to sacrifice to the one that died for us, that stamped his image on us. We worship you and you alone. And we get the opportunity to do that through our giving today sacrifice they used to sacrifice with animals and grain that was their currency today our currency is money somebody said I'll bring in a goat next week now that wouldn't I mean we might take it I don't know we maybe eat that thing I don't know what we could do but today we can honor God through what we give and as we honor God and as we loosen our grip on our finances, guess what will happen? It will loosen its grip on you. And as we do that, the church goes forward and the church makes a difference and more lives will be changed and more marriages will be restored and more homeless people will have care packages and, 
and more ultrasounds will be able to be provided. We also give to a foster ministry called the Isaiah 117 House. When kids are pulled out of drug-infested homes or domestic violence, they typically sit in an office, office cubicle in a, jail, in a jail somewhere until a foster person can come and pick them up. Sometimes for days they sit there. But there is a house where they can actually take the children to, where they can be fed, be loved on, be bathed, and have everything they need, prayed for, encouraged, ministered to, until a foster parent comes and gets them. These are the types of ministries that we get to give to. The difference we can make if we come together is so significant. It's not just a temporary difference. We make eternal differences. The church of the living God. So here we are. We're praying. We're believing. We're bending our ear toward heaven. Ask yourself the question, is this a sacrifice? I've sat in moments like this and I've had to rip a check up. Or I had to add to a gift because it just wasn't a sacrifice doesn't happen often, but it does happen from time to time. What does a sacrifice look like for you today? Let's pray with heads bowed and eyes closed. God, as you're speaking to people in many different ways, God, this isn't just a sermon for an offering today. That's, even, that's not even why we're talking about this today. It's a message from your word. Not so that we can receive some money today but so that you could get some hearts. That God, our hearts would be in you. That our hearts would follow our treasure as your word says. God, we give the idols. God, we lay them at the altar today. And we want you to be at the center of it all. God, I know somebody today may start trusting you financially for the first time. And God, I pray for a Malachi 3 revelation that you would open the windows of heaven, pour blessings so big they don't have room to contain it, that it would cause their faith to explode and enable this church to make a difference. Our hearts are open. Our yes is on the altar. In Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe you're here today and you're like, wow, this is... <laughs> I don't really believe in this Jesus thing and we're talking about money today, but I want you to know this. The reason why us as Christians are talking about this is because we have met a man named Jesus that has changed everything about our lives. He's changed everything. And this is something he's called us to do. And we believe we could never outgive him because he gave all of himself on a cross over 2,000 years ago. And you need to know today that that's where it starts. We're talking about being generous, but the reason why we can be generous is because he was generous to us first when he came and died in our place. The truth of the matter is, if you're here today, and you've never been forgiven of your sins, you need to be forgiven today. You stand in need of the forgiveness of God. There is a judgment that awaits and there is a place called hell that is real. And God wishes that no one should perish. So he brings you to a church today where you can hear that God loves you, that Jesus died for you, and that you can be forgiven and you can be saved right now. You say, I want that. I need that in my life. I want to be changed by him. If that's you, I want to invite you to pray with me now. And as I pray out loud, you can pray silently and you can give your heart and life to God. God's been speaking far before today. You know you need this. You know this is your moment. Don't push it off to the side. Just say yes to him now. Let's pray if that's you. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I know that my sin separates me from you. And I want to say that I'm sorry for my sin. I believe Jesus died. I believe he rose from the dead. And I turn from my sin. And I turn to you. I ask that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit and change my life. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me. It's in your name I pray.